part 3 means go watch parts 1 and 2 first. I am not going to pad this video longer by recapping what happens in them, except for what was happening behind the scenes, along with the lore in how the game's world ended up like this. To summarize, this video will cover what led to the game opening with our playable character with his sister in that abandoned quickie mart, what happened during that 1412 years long time gap, and what new information is learned during the New Game Plus retelling of the adulthood half of the game, and endings B, C and D. Ending E will be saved for part 4 due to its context bridging this game with Nier Automata. I'm beginning to understand. Climate change wasn't the cause of our woes. It was only a symptom. The real trouble started when something terrible came down from the sky. Ever since Nier was divided into Replicant and Gestalt, there has been some debate and confusion on which one of them is the canonical version of the story. Is it a story of a brother who wanted to save his sister, or of a father who wanted to save his daughter? There are some theories for and against the latter, such as how the brother protagonist has a backstory in a short story titled The Red and the Black, which foreshadowed the ending twist with the shades. And then there is the recent Nier Automata Ver 1.1a anime, where in one episode, Night is hacked into one of Emil's cloned heads to see into his memories, where the brother was present during the events of this game. Pretty much the only evidence to support the father character's presence in the history of Automata is the weapon story of Iron Pipe, or just the English version of it, which is told from Yona's point of view, where she calls out for her father, whereas in the Japanese version she calls out for her brother. However, there is a factor tied into the Drakengard universe that could make both protagonists canonical, and that includes not exactly exactly just time traveling, but rather a bootstrap paradox. See, the world of Drakengard is set in a medieval fantasy world similar to your typical JRPG, or a flipped version of Europe when looking at this map, where the history of that world started to deviate from ours when suddenly, a ruined version of a modern city just up and appeared over there in the year 856. It unleashed strange creatures that led the history of the world so to diverge into what it was in Drakengard 3, which was a prequel, and then to the fifth ending of the first Drakengard game. More information about that when I eventually get my hands onto the Drakengard games, or manage to get my PS2 emulator to work, or Square Enix decides to remaster the games for modern consoles. Anyway, the fifth ending of Drakengard saw the game's protagonist Prince Kaim, his dragon companion Angelus, and the final boss Queen Beast get sent through a rift in space and time from their world into ours. Meaning that my theory states that the modern ruined city that suddenly appeared in the world of Drakengard was likely sent from the future of our world as a late response to Kaim, Angelus and the Queen Beast being sent here. The two events are the beginning and the end of a looping timeline, and on different cycles when it starts over, the father becomes the main protagonist of Nier on some of them, and the brother becomes the protagonist in the other cycles. That is how both father and brother can be seen as the canonical protagonists. But in moving on to the lore of Nier set in our world, Kaim Angelus and the Queen Beast fell into our world precisely above the Shinjuku Ward in Tokyo, Japan, in June 12, 2003, where they fought each other either for just one hour or for a full week, according to the Fool's Lament's weapon story in version 1.22474487139. version, before Kaim and Angelus defeated the Queen Beast, only to be shot down from the sky by the Japanese Air Force. Angelus fell down to be impaled by the Tokyo Tower, from where her remains were then taken along with Prince Kaim's to be researched. However, the Queen Beast in her defeat disintegrated into dandruff, later referred to as mesoparticles, that spread around the Shinjuku Ward, where it then began to infect the people with what our world would eventually begin to call the White Chlorination Syndrome. 
Essentially, the symptoms of that disease made the people become infected with a choice of either forfeiting their bodies to the essence of the queen bees to control as her soldiers, or be turned into salt statues. Long story short, those who lived in Shinjuku ended up with the sword end of the stick. Naturally, the Japanese government built a wall around Shinjuku and left those lost koes trapped in there to be contained from the rest of the world so no one else could get infected. Except that by January 2008, the wall was eventually breached when the infected suddenly became organized under the leadership of someone called Red Eye, and they were to be called Legion, for they were many. Before that happened, however, the Japanese researchers studying Kaim and Angelus' remains had done enough research to confirm the multiple world theory that suggested the existence of other worlds outside of our dimension. And with Angelus' remains, the fantastical magic from Dragon God was so introduced into our world. When Red Eye and the Legion then broke the wall keeping them in Shinjuku, it led to them spreading across Japan by October of 2008. Finally, in January 2009, the Japanese government joined forces with the United States in at first going with just carpet bombing of Shinjuku, which then led to the nuking of the entire island nation of Japan for the third time after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Although Legion was eliminated in Japan, the nuclear strikes caused the infectious nasal particle to spread to the neighboring China. It was only a year later, in February 2010, when new cases of Legion were found over there, and by April they were seen all around the world. In other words, near foresaw that you can probably guess what recent thing would happen. In March 2014, Project Gestalt was initiated to combat the white chlorination syndrome by separating the human souls from their deceased bodies, which was presented as going into Gestalt mode. I quickly explained this in part 2, as Gestalts being the souls separated from human bodies that would then be placed into new replicant bodies. Two years later in 2016, the Hamelin organization founded by the United Nations finally managed to discover a way to resist it and began to develop anti-legion soldiers to combat their spread of the white chlorination syndrome. This included Emil and his sister Halua in explaining how they ended up being turned into weapons and what they were created to fight against. And another anti-legion soldier was Yura Masayoshi, whose bloodthirsty and ruthless behavior eventually led to him being denied of ever getting a replicant body when he was turned into a gesta. And so, he eventually went to become that particular gestalt or shade who possessed Kaine. More about that later. Then there were the child soldiers in the short story, and then there were none. Imagine the Battle Royale movie as an example, where child soldiers are locked in a room and forced to kill each other. I say child soldiers, as they were conscripted as 9 year olds and fought against the Legion until Red Eye was defeated. By that time, the oldest survivors had grown up to be 16 years old. And when they turned 19, the Hamelin organization chose 13 of those soldiers for an experiment meant to quote, Lucifericize, unquote, a new way to resist the white chlorination syndrome as a part of Project Gestalt. And as I already said, those 13 child soldiers were made to kill each other, and in death, they were then absorbed into magical grimoires powered by Angelus' remains. One of those three survivors who killed most of the others went to become Grimoire Noir, while the other two who had protected each other to survive were then also turned into books while begging each other not to leave them alone. And if you already guessed that the other one of them went to become Grimoire Vice, then you can only imagine the unseen tragedy it must have been when the two met each other again, a millennia and centuries later, not being able to recognize each other, and Vice helping the main character kill his forgotten friend as an another obstacle on their way. Those grimoires and their mascopied replicas were then used to separate human souls from their bodies with otherworldly magic by spreading them to the surviving humans around the world. But as we learn in part 2, placing them into corresponding replicant bodies was faced with setbacks as those replicant bodies eventually began to develop sentience. 
and those setbacks then cause the souls of the humans, aka gestalts to, in loss for better words, get stressed out in not having a grip on reality, which then cause them to become hostile and eventually be labeled as shades. Eventually, the Hamelin organization found someone with a strong enough willpower while being turned into a gestalt and shared that willpower with the other gestalts to keep them in check. That someone was our player character from the beginning of the game, who eventually went to become the Shadow Lord. For he was promised that eventually when the Project Gestalt could fix that glitch in their system not allowing the Gestalts to enter their replicant bodies, would Yona be cured from her illness. Well, 1412 years later, the Shadow Lord ran out of patience, and along with Grimoire Noir, who had spent all those years as his constant companion, similar to how Vice eventually did with our main character, he went to do something we can all probably guess what that something was. Dear God. <laughs> Yoda! But there is something you might not know. Remember this scene. Remember our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal. White and black shall fuse to one and set free shades to the world. Use us. No, I cannot. I will not. I will never. Your chance encounter with this boy. Your collection of the sealed verses. It was all set in motion by the Shadow Lord himself. The time has come for us to create a new and perfect world. We shall become as one, you and I. Become one. Vice, you dumbass! Try me. Start making sense, you rotten book, or you're gonna be sorry! Maybe I'll make the pages out one by one, or maybe I'll put you in the goddamn furnace! How can someone with such a big smart brain get hypnotized like a little bitch, huh? Oh, Shadow Lord, I love you, Shadow Lord! Come over here and give Vice a big sloppy kiss, Shadow Lord! Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! I am one with the Shadow Lord. Bitch. Grimoires exist to create in this world a new and just paradise. We must unite. The world demands it. Paradise. And we are so close to realizing it. Please don't go, Vice. Who's there? It's okay. I'll understand. I'll understand if you forget us. But I promise I won't forget you, no matter what. I'll keep the memory of Grimoire Vice alive forever. And that's... That's not all I'll do. You hear me? I'll chase you to the end of time. And I'll bring you back to us. So please, please. Please come back. Damn it, we need to stop him. If we don't do something, the black book will absorb vice. Yes, now we shall unite to common purpose. Then the world can finally bear witness to our true power. Vice! Vice! For the last time, my name is Grimoire Weiss, and it is not to be abbreviated. Uh, Weiss, Weiss! Good to see you, Kaine. Although I don't think anyone has ever accused me of being a little bitch before. <laughs> and you, we meet again. Weiss, you okay? I believe I could ask you the same question right now. Impossible. We must unite. We must become as one. I don't like you, and I want nothing to do with you. Besides, I have my companions. You're back! Of course, they're weak, and they whine when I leave. Vice. It's almost too much trouble, but they are my friends. I shall fight by their side, now and forever. Vice, thanks. If Grimoire Vice and Grimoire Noir had united and become one, that would have done what Project Gestalt had originally wanted to achieve in the first place. Unite the Gestalts and Replicants as one, and so restore the humanity. See, the forms of the Gestalts, or Shades, can be seen when properly observed as strands with strange symbols on them, and those symbols are also seen circling around the replicant Yona's hand when she is first seen infected with Black Scroll. Those symbols are from the angelic scripture of the Drakengard world, and in our English alphabet they correspond with A, C, G, and T. Those characters represent the DNA nucleobases of adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. 
Even when the humans were turned into gestalts by separating their souls from their bodies, they still carried the DNA of their biological selves. And according to the game's original director, Yoko Taro, when killed by the player character, their wounds temporarily try to return to their human states. And that is why they always end up bleeding. And when the replicants begun to show this pattern as what is seen as the Black Scroll, it is to show that the Gestalt corresponding with that replicant has begun to relapse. With us talking about Yona here, that should explain how and why the Shadow Lord end up running out of patience to wait for Project Gestalt to fix its glitch. However, as we saw in the opening prologue that Yona had begun to relapse in beginning of turning into a Gestalt, she was always sick and so placed into a suspended animation in a half-relapsed state. Meaning that no matter how many replicant bodies would have been made for her, all of them would fall victim to the Black Scroll. And so, even if the Gestalt Yona had not left her replicant body at the end of part 2, the Black Scroll would have eventually claimed her life, and her replicant body left to reunite with her brother would eventually share the same fate. <laughs> Okay, I think that was most of the lore exposition on how the game's world ended up as it was found in the opening scene. Now let's move on to the new game plus. Also, to address these visuals, I played all the different playthroughs with different skins. So, on this next playthrough leading up to ending B, I picked up the For Yorha DLC and so made the main character dressed like 9S and Kaine dressed like 2B. This second playthrough begins from the point where Emil has merged with his sister and is about to reverse Kaine's petrification. And this scene, like most of the playthrough from here is, while still played controlling the main character, told from Kaine's point of view. Starting with this long text story telling her life story. And I'm not kidding, this text story is long. Like when I streamed this part, it took 35 minutes to get through the first few parts of it before we had to replay that quick fight against the shade lock in the basement of the library, and after that, 5 more minutes of text stories. All this reminds me to remind you that this was a remaster, not a remake of a 2010 JRPG that had a certain budget. To summarize these long stories, they explore Kaine's life from before we met her in part 1, in explaining why she is ostracized by the people of the Airy, how her grandmother raised her to cope with her pain, by cursing like her life actually depends on it, why she is dressed like this, and how she came to be possessed by a shade. The answer to that first question is because in the future they live in, the knowledge of human biology has been lost and without it, Kaine being an intersex person is seen as her being different, and she herself also has self-hatred for having a Goddamn mutant body! Yes. Kaine is an intersex, meaning that if you were to look up any Rule 34 fan arts of her online, a majority of them would have the Futanari tag on them, because she has both male and female reproductive organs. The game itself never draws any attention towards that fact, but instead focuses more on the results of it. As Kaine is a replicant like most other characters in the game, her original human self that was turned into a gestalt was supposedly not intersex, but rather a normal human woman. And the reason why she ended up the way she is can be blamed on a similar glitch that kept the gestalts from merging with their corresponding replicant bodies. Still, just like with Emil's homosexuality, Kaine's status as an intersex is not paid much attention to or stated outright by either of them to anyone. Instead, there are few hints pointing towards both, and I think I have paid more attention to them here in this video than the game has. Yoko Taro has justified making Kaine and Emil in the story this way, by stating that people like them do exist in real life, even if we don't know. 
Also, now I can probably share my theory on what Kaine told Emil back in part 1. That like Emil with his eyes, she is also ashamed of her body because she has a dick. Or maybe she taught him a new curse word. You're gonna die today, shithog! Shithog? Oh, come now, that's not even a real word. Just don't die on me. I won't, Kaine. Let's take care of these shithogs. Anyway, Kaine having both male and female reproductive organs are what made the people of the area see her as different and so caused them to bully her quite graphically, while her grandmother Kali was the only person who treated her with kindness. She also taught Kaine how to have a cursing attitude, and seeing Kaine wanting to be a girl made her wear clothes like this so she could lean more towards her feminine side. And that is why Kaine's default model is dressed like this, with whatever she might or might not have down there being covered by her nightgown. Finally, there is how Kaine ended up being possessed by a shade. On a seemingly random and ordinary day in the life of Kaine and her grandmother, she was sent on an errand to the Eri, and on her way back came to find their home in flames, with her grandmother barely alive in there, and this shade from part 1, whose name is Hook by the way, towering over it, laughing. Kaine tried to fight against Hook unsuccessfully as it killed her grandmother, and almost also her, and then he showed up to the scene. The Gestalt of Yura Masayoshi, who after 1412 years had come to be known as Tairan. He took sadistic pity on Kaine and revived her while also giving her strength to fight Hook. Tairan would have taken over Kaine's body, but refusing to die, My it was using his voice. She'd never tell me to give up on life. Never! Kaine refused to let Tairan take over her body and pretty much left him possessing her body without handing over the control over it. Kaine's emotions are also a required factor in keeping Tairan from taking over and that also gives her hostile attitude and another layer. And so the lore is covered for me to move on to the last few scenes as seen from Kaine's point of view. Because as she is possessed by Tairan, Kaine can understand the shade spoken language, which was originally gibberish to our main character, Vice and Emil. And now there are subtitles for us to read when the shades are speaking. Let's start with Gretel at the Lost Shrine, and how he had spent those five years after Hansel was killed by us, just wallowing in depression. Eventually he was approached by Shades, who also lived at the Lost Shrine, and just when Gretel was about to pick himself back up, we showed up and killed him along with the Shades he had befriended. Ain't you excited, sunshine? We finally get to bathe in blood. Don't talk to me. <laughs> I want to kill so bad I can barely stand it. <laughs> this is one stubborn son of a bitch. Damn it, damn it, damn it! Hey there, sunshine. You ain't feeling bad, this week, are ya? Ain't no turning back now. You gotta lust for blood. Embrace the slaughter. All we know is the thrill of battle. Ain't that right, Kaine? <laughs> it's all over for you, sunshine. And that is Tyran, by the way, whom we can hear now in these latter playthroughs. Next up, we learn that the little shade and the machine that Gideon played for Jacob's death were not only innocent, duh, but also just at the wrong place at the wrong time. The shade was a young child named Khalil whose Shade Mother sacrificed herself to protect him from the replicants who saw the Shades as dangerous creatures. Khalil was so left alone in the depths of the junkie, from where he was then discovered by the Guardian robot B-33, whom Khalil came to eventually call Bibi as they became friends. You have taught me much, Khalil. You have helped to expand my vocabulary. You have instructed me in the ways of the outside world. Because we are friends. 
And when Gideon sent us to kill them, the boss fight was mostly P-33 trying to scare us away from them, while Khalil was smart enough to see that they were not going to win against us. Then when P-33 then grew itself wings and flew up to tear the ceiling open, he wasn't going to bring its roof down on us, but rather trying to help Khalil escape from being killed by us. Bibi, I'm sorry, I'm not strong enough. Wanted to be with you forever. Khalil, together. Bibi, alone. Bibi, cry. You stupid machine! You killed my family! You took everything from me! Next up on the list we have Postman Hans and that little shade girl. We learn that he had indeed discovered her inside the wrecked ship and named her Louise. What are you doing here, kid? And who are you anyway? Were you a passenger on this ship, maybe? <laughs> hey, it's okay. You don't need to be scared. And on this boat, kid? Actually, scratch that. First things first. I can't just keep calling you kid. You got a name? Well, this is going nowhere fast. Let's see. Hmm. Louise. Yeah, what about Louise? I mean, it just sort of popped into my head, but what do you think? <laughs> Guess you're okay with it. Well, it's nice to meet you, Louise. Because she was a shade, Louise was unable to leave the ship without revealing her true nature to Postman Hans. Why did things turn out like this? Did he leave because of his body? I just want to be able to talk with him. I don't want him to be afraid of me. I don't want him to hate me. I want to be And the reason why she ended up killing people from the seafront came from the false information given to her by Devola and Popola. Assess. How goes the code breaking? Harder than I expected. It's going to take some more time. More importantly, how is the child who drifted ashore getting along? Right on schedule so far. I mean, we knew she was powerful enough to destroy an entire ship, but now she's grown even stronger. There is one thing, though. She's started to obsess over becoming... human. If that's a problem, we need to nip it in the bud. If the Shadow Lord resists the plan, we'll need her power to defeat him. It's a fool's dream, and we both know it. She doesn't have a receptacle, so she can't become human, no matter how badly she wants to. This is only revealed on the third playthrough in cutscene showing them talking about their true motivations, and Louise was revealed to have been a backup plan for them to use against the Shadow Lord because of how powerful she is. Of course, they had convinced Louise to cooperate with them on a lie, promising something she couldn't have. A replicant body to go into, which had never been created for her, and Louise was so screwed either way. I don't know where she got the idea to kill and eat people from the seafront, but Louise genuinely believed that she would become human by doing that, and her motivation for that was all on her wanting to leave the ship to live with Postman Hans, who had even tried to teach her how to write so they could communicate. She even states it out loud for us to hear now that we can understand shades. Oh, listen, it's singing! This thing actually thinks it's a person! <laughs> I don't 
don't know where the singing lessons came from, but I do know it's sure as hell trying to eat us! Motivation matches again very well with the original version of Little Mermaid. Not the Disney version, the original Hans Christian Andersen version. You're doing it for him? How sad. How precious! The final confrontation with Louise is then different on the second and third playthroughs. The second one goes pretty much like how I showed it happen in part 2. Louise overpowers us when we fail a quick time moment and almost kills us, until postman Hans distracts her by telling her he is disgusted at her, and Louise turns towards the sea depressed so we can shoot her in the back. Then in between cutscenes, Kaine is shown to have found some of those letters that Louise had tried to write for Postman Hans, and on the second playthrough, Kaine tears it apart. But on the third playthrough, we no longer fail the quick time moment and manage to weaken Louise so that she won't get the chance to finish us off and Postman Hans won't get the chance to tell her they are over. So we run up on her giant body up to her weak spot, kill Louise without her heart breaking, and this time Kaine delivers the letter she found to Postman Hans. It only has two words on it. It says... Thank you. <laughs> wow, look at this. After all that time I spent trying to teach her to write, she actually managed to string together a few ugly little letters. Damn it. Why can't I stop seeing her smile? Or hearing that song she used to sing. I know she ate people. I know she was a monster. Also, the red bag woman can be told that her husband is dead, which will break her down, or she can be lied to about her husband leaving her which then causes her to feel guilty over driving her husband away by all of their fighting. Your husband was killed by a shade. I 
I'm sorry. No, it can't be true. It is. A big idiot, always carrying his bag around, thinking about me all the time. Oh God, this can't be happening. Then when it comes to the Eri, I don't think there is much to say about how we are pretty much sent there by a probably forged letter that Devil and Popola wrote. There are mostly just new subtitles from the Shades condemning us for having come there in the first place, and then there is also a new text story told from Emil's point of view, as he kills the Shade composed of everyone on the Eri. And that text story actually makes this part of the scene properly be told from Emil's point of view. See, early on in the adulthood half of the game when Emil merged with his sister Halua, this text story suggests that when Emil kills the population of the Eri, his body is taken over by Halua, who as weapon number 6 was created to destroy. So when Vice comments on about Emil being taken over by his instincts as the ultimate weapon, it could be literally that by having Halua take over her former body. The text story itself is a flashback from the time when Legion was still at large in our world, and Halua as weapon number 6 meant to fight them had gotten out of control. This is why Emil had initially been turned into a male Gorgon who turns everything he looks at into stone. And when Halua was out of control, Emil was dragged violently and in a borderline child abuse kind of way to pacify her. Oh, and the soldier who dragged Emil to Halua while yelling at him to not take off his blindfold, Yura Masayoshi, back when he was still human and before he became Tyran. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I killed innocent people. I killed them all. <laughs> but you saved us. If it wasn't for you, I'd all be dead. We owe you. Next, let's go over the wolves who attacked the wedding at Facade. Well, it turns out they had a reason for it, as their shade leader, Rock, had initially wanted to let the people of Facade be, while blaming them for having turned what was originally a luscious forest into the desert we see in the game. But seeing them as deprived of their habitat and resources as they were. However, then came the day of the wedding between the king of Assad and Fyra, which led to some over-eager guards to want to secure the event by killing as many wolves as they came across to keep them away from Assad. The deterrent could have probably worked, but then those guards also ended up slaughtering the puppies, which Rock saw as the last straw. And the rest is history. When the King of Facade eventually killed Rock to avenge Fyra, the Shade's final words towards him were accusing the King of stealing his own words and thinking back to his owner. An old man who had given away his position in Project Gestalt for him, in seeing that he had lived a life long enough and asked for his old friend to think about him now and then. Thank, thank you for being my friend. This is where the loyal part in the Cerberus comes. Now, when moving towards the endings, those orbs at the Shadow Lord's castle that attack us and we attack back are revealed to be Gestalt babies, 
which explains that Shade's anger against us better and why it is named Goose, as in Mother Goose. As a matter of fact, most of the characters in this game are named after storybook characters. We had Hansel and Gretel, Louise was clearly based on the original Little Mermaid, and Postman Hans was named after Hans Christian Andersen. Also, Louise died pretty much like how the Little Mermaid died in the original story by turning into sea foam. At the junk keep, Gideon and Jacob were supposed to be named after Jiminy Cricket. Their mother Blue was based on the Blue Ferry, and the man she was planning to leave her children for was named Carlo, after Carlo Collodi, who wrote Pinocchio. B-33 was supposed to be the stand-in for Pinocchio, Khalil was meant to be a stand-in for Cleo the Goldfish, and the junk keeps defense system was literally named Geppetto. Hook was named after Captain Hook, with that composite shade Emil killed was named Wendy from Peter Pan, and Rock was named after the giant bird from Sinbad and the Arabian Nights. And the Hamelin organization was named after the town where the Pied Piper stole the children from their parents, with their project to turn Emil and Halwa into weapons being named Snow White. And in part 4 I'll tell you where the Sleeping Beauty is. And now to the endings. You took the lives of our family. Demon, you stole our children's future. Ending B is told more or less from the Shadow Lord's point of view after our main character killed him. After that, he finds himself in the abandoned Quickie Mart where the game began and reunites with Yona, who shares a cookie with him. Then they are shown to be in a white void, which I might guess is the Purgatory, where the Shadow Lord and Yona now exist as souls, while the souls of the other Gestalts that his replicant body just killed just fade away. Also, Emil is revealed to still be alive as only a head, which is how he will be met again in Nier Automata. Just ahead. I wonder where everybody is. I can't wait to see them again. But before that can happen, there's some stuff I gotta do first. Like finding a body. Or at least some legs. I sure hope Kaine and Vice haven't killed each other yet. I swear, leave them alone for one minute. Then we get to ending C and D, which to unlock you need to have collected all 28 weapons in the game. These endings are kind of the same, with a divergence separating them into different endings. This ending is built up to with Tyran commenting on Kaine's actions throughout this latter half of the game. And at the point after Emil has done his heroic sacrifice, Kaine has realized that she is in love with the main character, and she no longer cares about what Tyran is telling her. She was many things when Tyran possessed her, and she has become many more things that Tyran has bullied her over. But none of that matters to Kaine anymore, because the main character has accepted her as how she is, and forgiven her for the things she has done. So Kaine is helping the main character rescue Yona from Shadow Lord, and after Yona is saved, Kaine walks away, just as the Black Scroll is beginning to take over her replicant body. Remember, 
With the Shadow Lord gone, the Gestalts lost the willpower he was sharing with them, and Kaine's Gestalt, wherever it might be, along with Tyran, is now relapsing, and Kaine herself does not have much willpower to go on anymore either, as she has done the last thing she wanted to do. So the Black Scroll takes over Kaine's body and she relapses, using the last of her willpower to ask the main character to let her out of her misery. The following boss fight with her is then a similar interactive cutscene as after Gretel was killed, where our main character has to dodge Kaine's magic attacks and say he won't kill Kaine as someone he loves and will save Kaine. Then Tyran, for the first time in the game, lets the main character know about his presence, and says that he will use his powers possessing Kaine to keep her in place for us to kill her, but the main character again refuses. Here comes the diverging point separating ending C and D. Once Tyran stops Kaine, he gives us the chance to either kill Kaine to let her out of her misery, which is ending C, or make her a real human again, somehow, by foregoing with the main character's existence with ending D. That latter one means, delete your save files. Now, there are two schools of thought on these endings, with the game's original director Yoko Taro seeing them as the choice for the player. If we have come to like Kaine after playing through the game two to three times, then sacrifice yourself and save her, and if not, then let her be killed off. Then there is novelist Yun A. Shima, who has written novels for both Nier series as well as for Final Fantasy 13 and 15. She sees ending C as the father's choice, and ending D as the brother's choice. Quote, a father is responsible to his own daughter, so he couldn't just give up his existence. He feels that it's his duty to protect Yona and raise her so he'd kill Kaine and live on. On the other hand, a brother and sister both coexist with and depend on each other, so maybe he'd choose to disappear and be relieved from his burden." Unquote. Regardless, in ending C, the main character stabs Kaine while also kissing her goodbye, while Tyran also fading away tells us Kaine's last words. I spent years inside Kaine's body, tormenting her from within. I felt her pain, her emotions, as if they were my own. And there was so much pain. So when I say she's free now, I want you to believe me. Thanks to you, Kaine has been forgiven and saved. Oh wait, she had a final message for you. Thank, Thank you. you. A lunar tear falls next to the main character. He picks it up while gazing through a window and states that they will always be together. And then there is ending D, where the player's fate and save files are deleted as the main character's existence is forgotten. He disappears, and Yona will believe that Kaine saved her alone. A lunar tear falls onto the ground. She picks it up and holding it, Kaine has a flashback on the main character and believes that she has found something special. There is still an ending E, which originally existed as a short story on Grimoire Nier, a Japanese-only strategy and world guide, of which translated Google Drive PDF file I have been using on other stuff not available on the wiki. There is also supposed to be an English version of a revised version coming out later this year. That short story was adapted into the version 1.22474487139... game, along with the Little Mermaid story, and in the final part 4, I will cover how it will bridge this game with Nier Automata. Kaine. This is a lunar tear. How pretty. We'll always be together. 
Special. 